Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, for our scripture reading to Hebrews chapter 3, please. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, we're going to read the first 11 verses of this chapter. Reading them responsibly, as we normally do, and we'll begin to get on one and alternate till we end together in verse 11. As our custom is, let's stand together to read our scripture tonight, and let's begin together on verse 1, Hebrews chapter 3. Ready? Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ has a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this evening. We pray, God, that you will continue to make our hearts ready to receive the word of God tonight. We thank you for the Bible, and thank you, Lord, for inspiring your word and preserving your words. Lord, I don't, do not believe tonight that the words we have in our hands are the words of man or the words of men. We believe them, and I believe them to be, the, in very truth, the words of God. And so I pray that they'll work effectually in each of us who believe this evening. And I pray that each of us would listen and mix with faith what we hear, and that we'd be doers of the word and not hearers only. Bless the special now as it's sung in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved one most precious in my eyes, I see your scars and hear your wounded cries. These tattered hands have caught your every tear. I share your pain, your suffering draws me near. I still know the plans I have for you, and I will lead you in the way I choose. Trust now my heart, my grace is still enough, forever rest within my faithful love. Forgiven lift up your broken eyes and dare to live in my restoring grace my blood atones for all your sinful shame i favor you because of my great name for i still know I have for you, and 
and I will lead you in the way I choose. Trust now my heart, my grace is still enough. Forever rest within my faithful love. Believe in one, hold fast so patiently. Unto the hope made sure at Calvary. One day you'll see this life is not in vain. I am the king, I'll soon return to reign. For I still know the plans I have for you. And I will lead you in the way I choose. Trust now my heart, my grace is still enough. Forever rest within my faithful love. Trust not my heart, my grace is still enough. Forever rest within my faithful love. Amen. Now, Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer as we come to once again to open up your inspired word. And I'm asking you, God, to help me as I bring the truth this evening and help each individual as they listen tonight. Help us to understand and to grasp the, the truth here this evening. I pray, Lord, that it'll make us more effective servants of yours and that we'll draw us closer to a, a closer walk with thee. And so, Lord, help us tonight and help each of us to give our attention now to the truth of your word. And Holy Spirit of God, do what only you can do. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. The author of Hebrews uses this word today and... It is not necessarily the way we would use today. Uh, when we talk about today, we're thinking about today, Sunday, 24-hour uh, period, now. And, and here, he's uh, using it in a different uh, application. He's applying the term today if you read Hebrews 3, from the period of time when Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, three days and three nights, until He rose from the dead, and then ascended back to heaven. And between that time and His return for us, that's the time that's called today. In other words, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the time of Christ on earth, His ministry here, that was yesterday. The time of His coming and His return for us and all the events then of the world after that and our time in heaven, that's tomorrow. But right now, it's today. That's the sense in which He uses the word today here in Hebrews chapter 3. We live in today, that time between yesterday and tomorrow. Yesterday was when God's plan of salvation was made known. Yesterday was when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Tomorrow is when we'll all be made complete who believe in Christ. We'll get a resurrected body when we see Him. Right now, the Lord wants us to tell everybody about Him. Right now, today, is when we have to tell others how to be saved. When we have to tell others the good news that Jesus is coming again. God does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so today is the day to listen to the call of the Spirit. As we heard this morning, tomorrow may be too late. So today is the day of salvation. Now here in Hebrews 3, the writer lets us know that Moses 
was a faithful servant and a faithful in all his house, and yet Israel failed to follow Moses. They failed to value him and to follow him. And, and the comparison here in the first in the Hebrews chapter 3 is the comparison between Jesus and Moses. And he's asking us in verse 1 to consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. It was faithful to him that appointed him as Moses was faithful over all his house. And this man, notice verse 3, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who builds the house has more honor than the house. And that's why, by the way, uh, whose house are we? We, are, we belong to God, remember? Uh, our, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so the one who builds the house has more honor than the house. Okay, And so our honor goes to God and the glory goes to God. But here, he's reminding us that is Jesus Christ worthy of more praise and more adoration and more fellowship than Moses was? Absolutely. He is worthy. Worthy means deserving. Worthy means possessing excellent qualities. Hold your finger in Hebrews 3 for a moment, if you would, and look with me at Revelation chapter 4. If you ever wondered what we'll do in heaven, once we're called out at the rapture, Revelation 4 and 5 answer that question. I believe in Revelation, I, believe, I still believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. I believe we'll be called out before God's dealing with Israel. And that's what the tribulation is. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. And the, the church, the bride of Christ, is not going to go through that time of trouble. The Lord is going to take His bride out. We're going to be presented to Him without blemish and without spot. And so, and I believe as you look at Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you have the story of the seven churches. Uh, and you go all the way through those seven churches. Once you hit chapter 4 and you read the first verse, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. He begins to describe the scene that's in heaven. And I believe that trump he hears like a voice, like a trumpet, is the rapture of the church. I believe that's our catching out of the world and into heaven. And I believe what we see unfold here in Revelation 4 and 5 is what we'll be doing in heaven when we get there. Now notice, one of the things we're going to be doing is we're going to fall down in verse 10 and worship Him that liveth forever and ever and will cast our crowns before the throne and here's what we'll say. Thou art what? Worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. And we'll just continue to praise Him. And we'll begin to say how worthy He is. That's the scene in heaven. That's us. We're going to be doing that. But the question before us tonight is this. Would we praise Him today? Will we serve Him today? Will we love Him today? Will we bow to Him today? Will we live holy before Him today? Today is very emphatic in Hebrews chapter 3. Look back there with me if you will. Today, God's speaking through a greater than Moses. God is speaking to us today. Several times He emphasizes this. If you have a pen and you mark your Bible, verse number 7, Wherefore His Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear His voice. Did you notice in verse 13 of Hebrews 7? Or Hebrews 3, rather. Verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 15, While it is said, Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. 
Look in chapter 4 and verse 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. I got an idea God's trying to emphasize today. Over and over and over again. When God repeats a word, it's not because he forgot he said it. It's because he's emphasizing it to you and me. That today. And again, it's not necessarily a 24-hour period as much as it means now. This present time. That's what it really means in 2 Corinthians when it says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. This is the time to be saved. Now, there's two thoughts I'm going to leave with you tonight and we won't be long. But two thoughts here in this passage in Hebrews chapter 3 that I think that we should do well to listen to tonight. Number one is today, listen to His voice. Listen to His voice. Notice what it says in verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear His voice. Verse 15, while it is said today, if you will hear His voice. Now it is interesting to note, isn't it? What, what they're quoting here, what's being quoted is Psalm 95. And it says those exact words. But it's interesting, the one who penned Psalm 95 was David. But it's interesting, isn't it, in verse 7? Wherefore, and by the way, right after wherefore, there's a parenthesis. What's a parenthesis in the Bible? It is a personal note from the author to the reader. So God is giving us a personal note. Who does God say pen these words? Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith. Wait a minute, I thought David wrote it. No, David wrote what the Holy Ghost said. You see, there's inspiration of the Bible. That's a confirmation that it wasn't that David was the pen man, but the writer was the Spirit of God. And now it's quoted here in the book of Hebrews. Now, the question comes, how do I listen to the voice of God? And this is something that, that um, most believers don't do. The, when most believers have their time with God, your quiet time, your devotions, whatever you want to call that, and uh, you get your Bible out and if you have a schedule, you'll read whatever chapters you're supposed to read or you'll just uh, read a proverb or whatever your, your systematic plan is of your Bible reading. I hope you have one. And they just read whatever it is supposed to read and then if they pray, if they have any kind of structure at all with their prayer, they'll have some kind of a prayer list or a prayer guide or a prayer journal. And oftentimes we get our list out and we begin to just read to God what we want. God, pray for this, and I pray for this person, I'm praying for that, and Lord, I need this, and Lord, I need that. And then we say amen, and we get up, and we said, well, I had my devotions. Now think about this. If I come down to Brother Danny, and I say, Danny, good to see you tonight, man. I'm glad you're here. Hope everything went well at Dayton Nursing Home and uh, things are going well at home with you and your wife and the job's going good and here you went to the wrestling tournament. I bet you that was a lot of fun and I'm sure you had a good time there and man, it was great. And hey, I got to go. Good talking with you. That was a great conversation, wasn't it? That wasn't a conversation, was it? That was a, that was a monologue. He didn't get a chance to say anything. You know why? I never paused to let him say anything. How many times in your quiet time with God do you pause to let God say something to you? How often do you just be quiet so God can speak to your heart? One of the great things about the daily journal with the RU program is it, it gives you some structure about a daily time with God. One of the things it does, it breaks up your prayer time into four different sections, and whether it's your, your praises, or you're asking forgiveness, or whether you're asking for needs, or whether you're asking for protection, there's a little word after each one of those, and it's pause. So when I want to say, I want to, it's time to praise God, 
I don't get my, thing, my list out of what I'm going to praise Him for. I get a blank card out and say, God, what should I praise You for? And then I listen. And then as God tells me, and God, I hear that still small voice of God. He puts, and, and you're not going to hear His voice like you're hearing mine. But you've had God speak to you. You've, you've heard God say, give that person a track. You've heard God say, go over and say something to them. Go ask that person if you can pray with them. You've, you've felt that nudge of God. And one, one fellow in the prison, I was explaining this, and he said, well, I paused and I waited, but, you know, I just had all these words come into my head. Well, that would be God. So you write those down, and that's what you praise him for. What really can revolutionize your time is when it comes to your needs. Do I just pray for what I think I need? Or do I say, God, what do I need? And whatever God tells me I need, I write down and ask Him for it. Now, if God told me to pray for that and to ask Him for that, what do you think the chances are I'm going to get that? He's the one who told me to ask for it. Why, why, why do we ask and we don't receive? It's because we ask amiss to consume it upon our lusts. Because we just get our list out. I have a list right here. It was written by one of our cleaners, and they gave me a list of some cleaning supplies they want. Okay? And, and, and that's kind of what we do to God. We just come to God and say, okay, God, here's what I need. And we just list it off. And we really don't know if it's what he wants us. Let, let me ask you a question. Who knows better what, you, what, what your children need, them or you? Mom and dad. You know, you don't get your child up and say, you know, what do you want for breakfast? Oh, ice cream and pizza. <laughs> yeah, I know. Brett says, what's wrong with that? But that's, that's another sermon for another time. But, um, well, uh, you, you, you say, no, you don't need ice cream pizza. Or if they're eating so much candy, you say, hey, that's enough. Why? They'll keep eating it and they'll get sick. You know what's best for them. Well, who knows best what I need, me or God? But I have to listen to his voice. I have to listen to him speak to me. You know, God, you know God will speak to you too. God will give you those leadings and give you those things that he'll speak to you through his word. That still, small voice. Adam heard his voice in the garden. He had sinned and he was hiding from God. But he heard the voice of God speaking to him, did he not? Abraham heard the voice of God as the knife went up and he was ready to come down and put it through the heart of Isaac. He heard his name. Elijah heard that still small voice of God. Now if I don't hear his voice, then the Bible says I have a problem. And you know what the problem is? Notice what he says. Today if you will hear his voice, what's the next four words? Harden not your hearts. He said that again in verse 15. Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your hearts. A hard heart does not hear the voice of God. Folks, how do you get a hard heart? You get a hard heart because you want to live your own life. Because you want to call your own shots. You want to be in control of your own uh, uh, daily living. Folks get a hard heart because their, their, their perception of God is a different one than what the Bible says. And so when God doesn't act the way they think He should, when He doesn't do what they think He should, then they're upset with God. How do we get hard? The Bible says we get hard in verse 13 through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is very deceptive. The sign they had outside a couple weeks ago was sin fascinates and then sin... Nobody saw it, huh? Not you. You're not allowed to say it. What was it, Danny? Then sin assassinates. And that is absolutely true. 
It fascinates and then it assassinates. It disguises itself and tries to convince us that it's something other than what it really is. Sin will draw us in and then devour us. The children of Israel hardened their heart. And they didn't listen to the voice of God. You know what God did? It, notice, God, God got mad at them. Is that what it says? Look at verse 10. Wherefore, God says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart. They have not known My ways. It grieved God. Here they are, 400 years, and we read about today in Egypt, and the plagues came, and finally the death of the firstborn, and Pharaoh says, Get out of here, go! And they spoiled the Egyptians and took gold and silver and all kinds of precious things, and they took off. And then remember the story? Pharaoh changed his mind and pursued after him again. And God drowned them all in the, in the Red Sea as He brought the waters back down. And then, then He led Israel by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And He fed them, gave them manna, and took care of them as they went in the wilderness and, 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 and guided them. And, and though they had a great deliverance and though God took care of them, what, they began to murmur and complain. Sounds like us. God cares for us and takes care of us and has saved our soul and given us His only Son. And boy, if we get somebody say something about us or talk about us or mistreat us, we're grumbling to God and complaining. They provoked God in the provocation. They provoked Him. They got all the way up to the promised land and they sent in the spies. Twelve of them went in and ten of them came back with a bad report. Negative report. We can't take the land. Unbelief went through the camp. And it's interesting when you read that in Numbers 14, the Bible says they, they, the, the, the Israelites were weeping. There's always sorrow when there's unbelief. There's always sadness when there's unbelief. They wouldn't listen to Joshua and Caleb who had the faith to believe God would give them the land. And when they refused to obey the Lord, they refused to listen to His voice, He sent them back out in the wilderness for 40 years. You see, just as quickly as Pharaoh and the Egyptians got over their fear of God, the Israelites lost their faith in God and their trust in God. And their unbelief cost them everything. That generation that came out of Egypt doubted God and they never entered into the land of Canaan because of unbelief. Now Canaan is in heaven. Canaan is a victorious Christian life. It's a, it's a joyful Christian life. It's, it's where you have battles, but you win the battles. The greater is He that in you than he that's in the world. You don't go from defeat to defeat to defeat in the Christian life. It's from victory unto victory His army shall He lead. So they, 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 they believed God could get them out of Egypt, but they didn't believe God would get them into Canaan. How many Christians believe God can save their soul from hell and they'll ask Jesus to be their Savior, but they don't believe He can get victory for them in their everyday life? Jesus came not just to save us from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin in our life. We don't have to live under sin's bondage. The 40 years in the wilderness became a 40 year long funeral procession. Someone has said that if there were 600,000 men who were of that age to go into the promised land that God said their carcasses had died in the wilderness, if all those men had to die out in those 40 years, you'd average almost 90 deaths a day in the wilderness. That's a whole lot of funerals, my friend. Talk about a 40-year-long funeral. That's about what it was. 
That's about how some people's Christian life is. They feel like it's, a, it's just one sad day after another. One weeping day after another. One time a morning after another. And God tells us this in Hebrews. Why? Because He's trying to give it to us as a warning. As an example. Not to follow their example. Not to follow their footsteps. Not to, not to have a wilderness experience, but to have a promised land experience. That's what God wants for us. God said, Beware. Verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of... What kind of heart is an unbelieving heart? It's an evil heart. An evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Did you know that, that, that departing from God's in each one of our hearts? How many of you know somebody who used to sit in church just like you're in church tonight? Used to be faithful Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Maybe they were active in Sunday school or bus ministry and they were... Uh, witnessing to others. I mean, they were just faithful. Who tonight, today, Lord's Day, they weren't even in church and won't go to church. Anybody know anybody like that? Look at that. And I know sometimes we look and say, man, how can, how can they, man, I remember that person when they used to do this and used to do this and used to be this. How can they not go at all? What, what happened to them? And, and yet you realize something. That same heart's in you and me. If we yield to the unbelief, if we yield to uh, the, what we know that's not true about God, and we don't cast that out, we'll follow that same, we'll depart. The word there is the same word for apostasy. That danger is in each one of us, that evil heart of unbelief. A heart that won't believe God, a heart that won't trust God, a heart that won't follow God. Do you hear His voice? Will you hear His voice or will you harden your heart? The great news is, if you continually seek to hear His voice, you won't harden your heart. He'll speak to your heart. So hear His voice. The second thing God wants us to do, besides hear His voice today, is to encourage others today. Look at verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. When it says you exhort one another, that's it's the the word exhort there is the same paracleto, it's it's paraclete, it's the same word for the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? The whole the word for the Holy Spirit means one called alongside to help. He's, why do you have the Holy Spirit? He's there to help you. There's no reason to say, I don't understand the Bible. No, you've got the Holy Spirit in you to help you. We established earlier, who wrote it? The Holy Spirit of God wrote it. You have the author of the book living inside of you. That's an amazing thing. And so, there's no reason for any believer to say, I just don't understand the Bible. Well, you're not asking for any help then. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Now, we encourage each other in three ways. Number one, we encourage each other with words. Words often can discourage us rather than encourage us. I know when we're young, sticks and stones will break my bones, but... Words can never hurt me. Huh? Yeah. When, it, when you're a kid, you don't really think very much. That sounded good, didn't it? How many realize when you get older, you'd rather have the sticks and stones than the words? Hey, bruises and cuts, they heal up. They heal up faster than the wounds. 
that go down into the innermost parts of the belly, the Bible says. They go deep. I've had people sit in my office and they'll tell me stuff that, that someone told them when they were five and six years old. And now they're, they're 50 years old. And they still remember that. That still is a wound to them. Words. That's what happened when, they, when the spies came back. What did the ten, what did the ten spies do? They, they discouraged everybody with their negative report. They had all the fruit from the land, the grapes and the figs, and it's a land that flows with milk and honey, but no, there's giants there, man. Fortified cities there. We're, we're, we're like grasshoppers compared to them. And boy, their, their discouragement spread like fire. So, so does yours. The Bible encourages us to speak words to each other that build up and don't tear down. You say, well, I just, I just got these bad things and I've got to tell somebody. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden and put it on Facebook and leave it there. <laughs> That's not what it says. Hmm? Take your burden to the Lord. And leave it there. We're called to be encouraging. Jesus said, I'm with you even unto the end of the age. You know what that is? That's encouraging. Never alone. He promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. He's always with me. There's nothing, there's nothing you can't overcome. There's nothing that you can't get through. There's nothing that you can't uh, find your way of victory over because greater is He that's in me than He that's in the world. There's victory in Jesus Christ. That's not just a song to sing. That's a way to live your life as a believer. So encourage. Do you encourage other people with your words? Do people leave you and say, man, that was enjoyable. Boy, it's always good to be around them. They're encouraging. We encourage them with our words. Number two, we encourage people by our actions. Words are powerful. Actions are meaningful. We spoke a couple weeks ago, I think, about Barnabas. A name, a name. Who remembers Barnabas' real name? Barnabas was a name given to him, his surname, his nickname given him by the apostles. Barnabas, his real name was Joseph. No, 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 you're not Joseph. You're Barnabas. You're an encourager. You're an encourager. Remember, he encouraged early church. He had property, he had land, he sold it, and he gave all the money to the church. Well, we need some Barnabases. <laughs> and then when Saul got saved and the apostles didn't want to receive him, who said, come on, Brother Saul? It was Barnabas. Those believers that Antioch got saved and numbers were believed. Who are we going to send down to encourage them and get them to cleave to the Lord and live for God? I send Barnabas. He's the guy. Actions. You encourage other people by your actions. One of the reasons that you, you come to church and you sing the songs and you shake people's hands and you smile at others, you know why? You're trying to encourage each other by your actions. Everybody here has come to church before and you looked for a particular somebody and they weren't here and you said, oh, they didn't come tonight. Oh, they're not here today. And there was a disappointment there. But there's other times that I see it when you're up on the platform. You see people see each other and, oh, good to see you. And there's a hug or a handshake. 
You say, man, I'm glad you're here. You encourage people by your actions. You encourage people by your words, and then maybe the most difficult of all is, C, you encourage people with your attitudes. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, when it says our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which we have of God, we're not our own, we've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Your spirit is your attitude. What kind of spirit do you have? When the Bible says Daniel had an excellent spirit, he just had a kind of an infectious spirit that you wanted to be around. Just, a, just a, a, a good guy, a positive guy. Spirit, listen, your attitude is infectious and contagious whether it's positive or whether it's negative. Every one of us can be brought down when we're around people that convey a sense of doom and gloom. Now, because of our sinful nature that we all are born with, we have a natural tendency to be negative rather than positive. That's why negative news sells so well. That's why the negative can spread so fast. There was a, a noted Christian, I guess, I guess you call him, what do you call him, Bob, an evangelist, Bible teacher, had a big lawsuit against him, some people who accused him of things. The day came to have full disclosure and write out the statements, and I mean, this was under oath and all that, and guess what? They all dropped the charges. So they admitted it was false. But the damage is done. They smeared a good man's name by lying. And everybody... Boy, they hear, you know, you know what's crazy? You'll, you'll hear the negative, and man, that's the headlines, and that's what you hear in the paper, and then when somebody comes up and says, no, it really didn't happen that way, there's a little section on the correction on the second page of the paper saying, oh, no, that, that wasn't right. That's how, if we're not careful, we can so easily see the negative and never be positive. You know how most, you know how most teenagers feel? Mom and dad, most teenagers feel like they can never please their parents. Because it's so easy to always see the negative in our children and never see the positive. Every now and then you need to just sit down and ask God, listening to his voice, ask him, Lord, let me write down some positive things about my children. And then share them with your children. Do they think of you as a positive person or a negative person? Anybody ever come to you and say, you know, I just, I'd just like to spend a little time with you because you're always so positive and I like being around you. You encourage other people with your attitude. And it doesn't mean that, hey, it doesn't mean that everything's always great. No, let, let, me, let me clue you in. It's not always great with anybody. Don't, don't, don't ever stop and think, oh, yeah, man, if I was you, pastor, good night. You don't have any problems. <laughs> How much time you got? <laughs> huh? Everybody's got problems. Everybody, got, everybody has things that doesn't go the way you wanted them to or the way you thought they would. You got issues, you got problems. But listen, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And those all things when he's talking about in that context there in Philippians 4 was, I've learned whatsoever state I'm in therewith to be content. He's talking about how to abound and how to be abased. He's talking about, man, I know when things are good and I know when things are bad. So said, how do I stay content? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. When you start complaining and you start being upset 
and, and saying, oh, this happened, and why did this happen, and I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I'm not happy with this. What we're doing is we're saying, God, why are you doing this to me? We found out Wednesday night who's in control of our life. God. God. Nobody ever comes up to somebody and says, boy, Danny, I'd just like to spend some time with you. You know, I just, I've been in a good mood lately, and I'd just like to be brought down and discouraged. So I knew if I just could hang around you a while, you know, just complain like you normally do and gripe about things and that'll help me. Nobody ever does that. But people will stay away from you. People won't want to talk to you or be around you. Encourage people by your attitude. That positive attitude affects people around us. Live in today. The time between the completion, between the beginning of God's plan of salvation, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, and the completion of our salvation when He returns. And we get our glorified body. That's today. And what are we supposed to be doing? Hearing His voice and encouraging one another. In words, in actions, and attitudes. C.I. Schofield. Anybody here have a Schofield Bible? A few Schofield Bibles here? He worked as a lawyer before he was saved. I guess they're saved lawyers, but that's another subject. One day, a Christian lawyer, Tom McFeeters, called on Schofield his office, and he was about to leave when suddenly he turned around to where Schofield was standing, faced him directly and said, for a long time, I've been wanting to ask you a question that so far I've been afraid to ask, but I'm going to ask it now. Schofield looked at him and said, I never thought of you of being, as being afraid, McFeeters. What's your question? McFeeders looked straight at C.I. Schofield and said, Why aren't you a Christian? There was a pause of silence for the question came very unexpectedly to Schofield and he was staggered by it. But then he answered, Does the Bible say something about drunkards having no place in heaven? I'm a hard drinker, McFeeders. McFeeters simply told him, you have not answered my question, Schofield. I ask, why are you not a Christian? Schofield said, well, I've always been a nominal Episcopalian, if you know what I mean. He said, I don't recall ever having been shown just how to be a Christian. I do not know how. To answer his friend, McFeeters had this answer. He got his New Testament from his pocket took a chair in the office, sat down, and read passage after passage from the Word of God, showing God's plan of salvation simply and clearly. Then he asked C.I. Schofield this question, Will you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? You know what Schofield said? I'm going to think about it. What was he saying? Tomorrow. And you know what McFeeter said? When Schofield said, you're going to th- I'm going to think about it, McFeeter said, no, you're not. You've been thinking about it all your life. You're going to settle it right now. Will you believe on Christ and be saved? And the two men just stared at each other for a few minutes of silence. And then Schofield looked at his friend and said, I will. And C.I. Schofield received Christ as his Savior. The problem today is when many people are asked about their faith in Christ, they point back to their exodus. They point back to Egypt. They point back to when they made a decision for Christ. And they'll talk about their experience because they feel like, how would anybody ever question that? 
After all, I prayed the prayer. There's nowhere in the Bible where it ever says you get saved by just praying a prayer. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. The children of Israel went forward. They left Egypt. They were identified with God's people. They, they drank from the same rock as everybody else. They probably used the same vocabulary as everybody else. But when trouble came, when some opposition was there, that they'd have to have faith in God and trust in God to overcome, they turned away. For some believers, for some who profess faith in Christ, their exodus is a very convenient memory. But the truth is, you have no victory in your life tonight. You exercise no daily faith in God now. And trust in God now. Do you trust God today? Do you believe in Christ today? Do you walk by faith today? If not, your faith is dead. Your faith is dead. If our hearts have become so hardened that we expect nothing from God and attempt nothing for God, then our belief is merely in our head and not in our heart. What are you going to do today? What are you going to do now? Are you going to listen and act? Or will you harden your heart? Today, today, I will listen to His voice and I will encourage others. By my words, by my actions, and by my attitudes. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth here tonight. Thank You for Hebrews chapter 3. Thank You, Lord, for Your emphasis on today. And Lord, I'm asking You for twofold tonight that each of us would look at, it, look at our lives and say, today... I want to hear His voice. Now is the time, God, for you, for me to listen to You. Lord, if there's a hard heart here tonight, if there's a heart that's been deceived by sin, there's a heart that's been hardened by not listening to You, that they fall on their knees and say, God, soften my heart. Break up the follow ground that I can have a tender heart that listens to You listens to your voice. Oh, I pray there'd be numbers of people that would cry out to you, God, let me be an encouragement to others. Let me exhort one another today. Let my words be encouraging. Let my actions be encouraging. Let my attitudes be encouraging to others. Today. Let my salvation consist of something that happened 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago. I want to walk by faith today. I want to have faith in God today. I want to see conquering sin and conquering the land today. I want a living faith. Speak to our hearts.